Hey Google, who is Jesus? Religion can be complicated and I'm still learning. Alexa, who is Jesus? Here's what I found on Wikipedia. Jesus, also referred to as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Christ, was a Jewish preacher and religious leader who is the central figure of Christianity. Christians believe him to be the Son of God and the awaited Messiah, Christ, prophesied in the Old Testament. In the last video, we looked at an introduction to the book by John Stott, Basic Christianity. Today I'm going to continue talking about this book, and we're going to look at the first major part of this book, which is who Christ is. When people are looking into Christianity, the first place that's important to look is to actually look at Jesus himself. And so that's what this part of the book does. It really just gives an overview of Jesus, what he said about himself, his claims, his character, what he was like, and finally, looking at his resurrection and what all these things point to. The claim, according to Christianity, is that Jesus is the Son of God. He's divine, and he's someone who we are to worship. So why is that? Why do Christians say this? Well, first of all, look at his claims. What did Jesus say about himself? It's interesting that Jesus was actually, you could say, very self-centered in his teaching. When you look at other great religious leaders, they tend to point away from themselves, whereas Jesus actually points to himself. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When you look at those teachings, you could definitely identify them as being very self-centered. I am the one you should be looking to is essentially what he's saying in all of those statements. He's also making direct claims in the scriptures. Jesus actually says that he is the Messiah and the Son of God. These are direct claims, and he even goes so far as to say that before Abraham existed, I am. And that is a clear claim of divinity. And so much so that the Jews reacted violently against that and wanted to stone him for statements like that. Jesus, aside from these claims, made indirect claims about who he was. He claimed to have the ability to forgive sins. At first that doesn't seem like a big deal, but if someone were to hurt your friend and I were to come along and say, I heard that that person hurt your friend and, and you're very offended by that, but you know what? I forgive them you would say, well, what right do you have to forgive their sins when they've offended me? That's exactly what the critics of Jesus said. Why are you going around forgiving people of, of their sins? What right do you have to do that? And the truth is, the only way you would have a right to do that is if you were kind of over the situation, like a judge is, to say you're exonerated, uh, you're, you're free of that charge. And Jesus is saying, I have the right to judge. I have a divine right to judge. That's an incredible claim, but it's a more indirect claim. And then finally, we see how he dramatizes his claims. We see how Jesus not only says these things about himself, but he demonstrates it. And that's seen, for example, in going back to those I am statements. Those are from the book of John. Parallel to those statements, we see in the book of John miracles that go along with each of those statements. And so when he says, I'm the bread of life, we actually see he's able to provide bread for people out of taking very little amount of food and then multiply that miraculously to feed people and then to point them to himself as the bread of life. Or when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm the life and the resurrection, he illustrates this by actually raising a man from the dead. So those are dramatized claims about himself showing what he said in a physical way. And then Stott concludes all of this by quoting from C.S. Lewis, who said, The discrepancy between the depth and sanity, and let me add, shrewdness, of his moral teaching, and the rampant megalomania, which must lie behind his theological teaching, unless he is indeed God, has never been satisfactorily got over. The idea is that if Jesus is claiming these things about himself, he's either a crazy person, He's lying, or it's really true. He's either a lunatic, he's a liar, or he's Lord. 
Those are really the only options based on the claims of Jesus. So that's what Jesus says about himself. Then we look at the character of Christ in the next chapter. And that's where we see Jesus really separated from other people. There are people who boast about themselves. Right now we have a president who is uh, very boastful about his achievements and who he is. And there are people that will then look at him and say, yeah, but what about this thing that he's done wrong? And what about that attribute of his? And so they don't think that what he's saying lines up with his character. When Jesus said things about himself, the interesting thing is that his enemies couldn't find any flaws in his character that violated what he was saying. And so, first of all, what did Jesus think about himself? Well, he stated that he was without sin. That's pretty remarkable because most people that are holy teachers are very aware of their shortcomings and their faults. That's why they're always pointing people away from themselves. But Jesus is very different in this way. He's actually saying, I haven't sinned. You can look to me. And we never see him being self-aware or feeling guilty or even confessing sin. He taught others that they needed to confess sin, but Jesus himself never confesses sin. But what did Jesus' friends say about him? It's important to remember that there were people like the disciples who were following Jesus for three years. And it wasn't like they were just showing up once a week to hear him teach. They were living their lives with him. They were traveling with him. They were eating with him and sleeping next to him. And they were spending all this time with him. And yet, what did they say about him? They said he was without sin. We actually read that in the writings of the disciples later in the Bible. Peter, for example, describes Jesus as a lamb without blemish or defect. John says that in him there was no sin. And the writer of Hebrews says that he was tempted or tested in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So even the disciples of Jesus, who were with him all the time, claimed that his character was pure and sinless. What about Jesus' enemies? Again, when someone makes boasts about themselves, uh, usually where that claim falls apart is with the critics. They're able to point out the obvious inconsistencies and flaws in what they're saying. But with Jesus, we have a different case. His enemies certainly wanted to find fault with him, but they really couldn't. And so when Jesus was on trial and his enemies were trying to find a way to prove him guilty, they had to actually hire false witnesses. Pilate and Herod, the men who were overseeing the trials, couldn't find any fault with him. And Pilate actually said, I wash my hands of this situation. I find no fault in Jesus. So when Jesus was put on trial, his enemies couldn't even find anything as grounds to charge him with guilt. And then we look at this for ourselves. We look at Jesus and we assess, okay, what do we see about this person as we read the pages of the Bible? We see that Jesus is a consistent and balanced person. He doesn't seem like someone who's emotionally all over the place and unstable. He's someone who has good, faithful character. He's unselfish, and actually, he shows us what love is really meant to look like. He suffers and dies even though he's innocent, and when he's on the cross, what does he say? He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Even in Jesus' greatest crisis moment, his moment of greatest rejection, and difficulty. He looked out and he continued to love people. His love extends way beyond anything that any of us are capable of. And that points again to the true sinless character of Jesus. The final chapter of part one talks about the resurrection of Christ. If we're making the case that Jesus really is the divine son of God, then one of the pointers to that claim is that he died and rose again. That's one of the ways we can know that Jesus is who he said he was. There is actually good evidence of the resurrection. I'm going to read a quote by a lawyer who wrote years ago, and his name was Sir Edward Clark. He states, As a lawyer, I've made a prolonged study of the evidences for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is conclusive, and over and over again in the high court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not so nearly compelling. Inference follows on evidence and a truthful witness is always artless and disdains effect. The gospel evidence for the resurrection is of this class, and as a lawyer, I accept it unreservedly 
as the testimony of truthful men to facts they were able to substantiate. This is a lawyer who covered court cases, and he came to the conclusion that looking at the evidence for the resurrection of Christ was just as believable and just as concrete as evidence that he's seen given in court that has proved a verdict. This reminds me of the modern day author, Lee Strobel, who has written the book, The Case for Christ, in which he details how he, as a reporter who covered court cases, was searching into Christianity. And what happened is that his wife became a Christian and he was an atheist and didn't really want to have anything to do with it. But as he began to look into the claims of Jesus and look at the evidence for the Bible and the death and resurrection of Christ, he realized that, just like that other lawyer said, there was a lot of evidence pointing to this historical truth. And he actually says there is a case that you can make that is just as provable as court cases that he witnessed as a reporter. And so there actually is historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Why is it so hard for people to accept it? Well, because we're talking about a miracle that's unprecedented. And there are a lot of people today who just categorically say, well, that can't happen. But if you look at the evidence, what does it tell you? That's what we really have to take a look at. So John Stott takes a look at the evidence and he details things that really go against some of the theories that people have made against the resurrection of Jesus. First of all, he points out that the body was gone from the tomb. Back then they would place people in these cave tombs. In this instance, they actually rolled a stone over the cave door so that no one could go in there and they placed Roman guards because they didn't want anyone to steal Jesus' body and make any false claims. And yet, Jesus' body was gone. And there has to be some way to explain how did anybody, if they were to steal the body, get past Roman guards and this huge stone that was in the door of the tomb. And so that is one evidence for something mysterious happening, something miraculous happening. Secondly, Jesus was seen. There are ten varied appearances of Jesus after his death given in the Gospels. And what's important to note here is that the disciples were not predisposed to see hallucinations. Some people might say, well, if they saw Jesus come alive again, it's because they were so in an emotionally distraught situation that they must have just thought they saw Jesus. It was really just some form of hallucination. But the way the Bible describes this and the way it's verified historically is that there were actually various people at various times seeing Jesus and there was an occasion where over 500 people saw Jesus at the same time. That's not a hallucination. So if these are not something that was made up and they're not hallucinations, then it points us to the reality that Jesus actually did come alive again. And finally, that leads us to a third point about Jesus' resurrection. A great point of evidence is that the disciples' lives were incredibly changed. The disciples, after Jesus died, were actually scared. And Peter, during Jesus' trial, one of the followers of Jesus, actually denied Jesus three times when people were asking him if he knew Jesus. He said, no, I, I don't know this man. He even swore and uh, gave an oath that he didn't know who Jesus was. But then a few months later, after witnessing Jesus' resurrection, we see him boldly telling people what had changed his life. And he was even willing, along with the other disciples, to give his life. So there you have it. We've seen who Christ is based, first of all, on the claims of Christ, and then secondly, the character of Christ, what he was like, and finally, the resurrection of Christ, this powerful event in history that points to something miraculous about who Jesus is.